Good morning, everybody. This is uh, possibly going to be our last uh, public gathering for a while. We'll see. Um, you probably all know that the Hutch um, and Children's Hospital have now um, advised their employees to avoid uh, public gatherings um, and even uh, professionally related domestic travel. And I was told last night UW may, uh, by the end of the week, have a policy consistent with that. But um, for now, we're here. Uh, welcome people who are following us remotely. Um, one um, kudo this morning is, is Matt Vincent here? No, maybe he's um, online. And one other question, does anybody know who, can anybody tell me who Brian Pridgen is? One of the hand Okay. So there's a very nice note from Brian Pidgeon. Um, letting us know that he really enjoyed working with uh, Matt Vitz Vincent, who Dr. Pigeon states is always extremely pleasant and helpful in clinic um, and was uh, technically uh, performing um, at a uh, level uh, significantly uh, above um, an R2. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Vincent. And with that, we'll uh, start our grand rounds. And uh, this morning, we have uh, one of our tumor fellows, Dr. Vokes, and two of our attendings, um, who you all know, Dr. Matt Thompson and Dr. Jared Howard. And they're going to be talking about uh, modern management of appendicular skeletal metastases by uh, primary tumor type. Thank you, Dr. Chancey. So thanks for having us uh, this morning. Uh, we're excited to talk about an, import an important topic to us, something that we see as a major part of our practice. Uh, as Dr. Chancey mentioned, my name is Matt Thompson. I'm an orthopedic oncologist practicing at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Dr. Uh, Harwood's my partner at SCC and also at the VA. And Dr. Bokes is our current fellow who will also be practicing nearby after graduation in July. We have uh, no relevant disclosures uh, related to this topic. Metastatic cancer is a uh, very impactful condition that uh, affects the United States. So in 2020, the American Cancer Association predicts that uh, we'll see 1.8 million new diagnoses of cancer. And relevant to our practice, half of those will metastasize to the bone. And so often the orthopedic surgeon is not only an integral part of treatment of patients with metastatic bony disease, but also often the first person to see that patient and recognize a metastatic process. So it's important that uh, the general orthopedic surgeon have a general understanding of how to initiate that workup and how to approach a patient with a potentially metastatic cancer. I'd also say that in the era of targeted therapy, uh, the orthoped there's an onus on the orthopedic surgeon to understand that the survival of metastatic uh, cancer is changing. And, and there are times when uh, our older dogmatic, dogmatic approach to uh, care may not be appropriate, and it's important that we choose a um, a surgical construct that can withstand uh, s several years of uh, survivorship in patients who are experiencing improved survivorship. That being said, the survival uh, when carcinoma becomes metastatic is very poor, but sometimes improved uh, dramatically in the setting of a targetable mutation or a new or novel uh, therapy. That's the minority of the time, though. Um, we can see very dramatic improvements in survival, but um, if you look at the duration of time that drug development requires, it is between 10 and 20 years to post-market surveillance. And the median cost of drug development is on the order of $650 million uh, per agent. Not only that, but only about one out of every 10 drugs who enter uh, phase one, uh, early, early phase one clinical trials actually move forward to FDA approval. And oncology is the lowest um, with a success rate of about 4.7%. Also, immunotherapies, which have been heralded as, as a game changer, uh, so far have only been shown to be effective in about 13% of patients receiving checkpoint inhibitors. So I think things are changing, uh, but the change will be slow, and it's important that we um, uh, pay heed to this important topic for our, our practices. So that's the depressing news. I think the good news is that as a thoughtful orthopedic surgeon, you can really make a meaningful impact on the patient's care. Uh, for your individual patient, but also as a part of the uh, larger community caring for these patients with difficult problems. A thoughtful approach to metastatic bone cancer may reduce morbidity and prevent suffering or improve pain. Our, one of our main goals is to spare the patient's function and preserve their ECOG, or their Eastern Cooperative uh, Oncology Group Performance Scale, so that they remain eligible for uh, uh, trial drugs if they're available. All of this also goes toward helping maintain the patient's independence and her quality of life. 
And I think an important role that we play, even when we're not um, hoping for that, is advocating for our patients. Um, I think we oftentimes are the ones who can recognize a situation where it's time to, to shift gears and to focus on a humane, a humane approach to holistic uh, end of life care. Because uh, we see orthopedic injuries as sometimes you know, the most uh, compelling evidence of a failing organism and um, can advocate for our patients and, and, and um, being honest with them and their, and their, their other providers about the risk uh, associated with an intervention that may not make that big of an impact on their overall survival. Uh, pain relief in the short term or um, function overall. And then finally, as uh, we approach these problems thoughtfully, we can also work to decrease complication rates, decrease length of stay and cost of care. So just kind of setting the groundwork for today. Uh, this topic, as you can imagine, uh, as the landscape is changing and we have newer therapies, it becomes a little bit more of a complex topic to, stay, to keep up on it can be very hard to digest. And so we want to give you a roadmap to approach this, uh, focusing on the salient features of an appropriate workup and treatment of patients with metastatic disease. It's important that you first understand the principles of evaluation. And Dr. Harwood's going to talk to you about that clinical evaluation and uh, focus especially on the importance of the social history and the patient's expectations and goals um, when diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And then also discuss uh, predicting and um, uh, predicting the risk of impending pathologic fractures. Dr. Vokes will then talk to us about uh, developing a, a plan in order to make sure that when you see a patient with a metastatic disease, you may not see that frequently, that you have a mechanism to understand that disease and understand what that patient's survival is so that you can choose your treatments uh, in the appropriate uh, context. We'll then talk about the key um, importance of communication and reconciling the patient's orthopedic and oncologic goals. Uh, and talk about the difficulty in predicting survival. And then finally, uh, we'll, apply, we'll talk about applying sound orthopedic principles, uh, and that may include non-operative treatment. It will definitely include the importance of perioperative management of, of the patient. And then finally, we'll talk about surgical principles applied to four basic contexts in which we typically treat uh, metastatic cancer. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Harwood. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I'm uh, Jared Harwood. Uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this presentation. I also uh, appreciate you all joining us. And I appreciate the, the framework that uh, Dr. Thompson laid. I'll be talking about uh, the evaluate phase. And as such, the uh, appropriate comprehensive workup of these patients. So when you have a patient that comes in your office uh, older than, or I should say wiser than 40 years old, uh, with a destructive bone lesion, in your mind, you should start to build a differential. And in my training, uh, we were taught that the first three things on that list should be metastatic disease, followed by myeloma, lymphoma, and everything else. Just to give you a, an idea of how common primary bone tumors are, there are only 3,600 of those di diagnosed each year in comparison to that 1.8 million that Dr. Thompson re referred to. Now, you want to talk about, uh, start with your history, of course, talk about the context of their presentation, the timeline and the evolution of their symptoms, the quality of their pain, whether it's localized or diffuse. You also have general red flags uh, that we often ask about, ask about but uh, very specific red flags. For instance, recently in, in one of my clinics, I was able to elicit a history of uh, coughing up blood, which was a first for me. The patient tried to minimize that, but it kind of got the uh, hair on the back of my neck standing up. And sure enough, when we uh, did some staging studies, he had uh, metastatic uh, disease in the setting of a soft tissue sarcoma. You also want to ask about self-exams, formal exams with things like prostate and breast. Uh, you want to know whether your patient's uh, been com um, complying with routine screening exams like colonoscopies. Certainly any personal history of cancer or predisposing conditions or syndromes would increase your suspicion as well. Certain medications uh, like anticoagulants and beta blockers. For social history, you want to know about uh, personal and occupational exposures, so tobacco, asbestos. Uh, and probably the intersection of this oncologic and orthopedic construct, you want to discuss function.
You want to know where they are currently, how that compares to their baseline, and what their expectations are. And that, uh, together with the environment that they live in, you know, what kind of support systems do they have? Is it a single story, multiple story home? You can start to build an idea of what you can offer them uh, to get them back uh, to that level of functioning if they proceed towards uh, surgery. You want to know about uh, any family history of cancer or uh, other concerning conditions um, that, again, we, we often ask about regardless of uh, the patient's uh, presentation. For physical exam, you'll start with uh, vital signs, but you'll want to trend them over time. If a patient has, uh, you know, uh, markedly elevated uh, blood pressure, for instance, that could be associated with pheochromocytoma. Uh, this is an instrument many of us may not have used as much as we did in medical school, but it has been well documented that even orthopedic surgeons can pick up on significant murmurs, which obviously has perioperative implications. We want to do a good abdominal exam. Also, the lymphatic system is of particular interest. <clears throat> many of the sarcomas we work with spread uh, hematogenously, but a lot of the adenocarcinomas uh, work through the, the lymphatic system. We want to watch our patients uh, walk. And in the right context, you might consider doing other physical exams that you haven't in a long time, like checking their thyroid. While invasive exams uh, like prostate, uh, things like that aren't uh, usually indicated, depending on the context, the patient's access to care and other variables like that, you might consider ordering additional uh, screening studies. In 1993, the group from uh, University of Chicago found that with a thorough uh, workup and evaluation of these patients, we can identify uh, primary tumors in 85 to 90 percent of them. That workup also includes things like uh, our standard laboratory tests, X-rays can be helpful, uh, both of the uh, bone involved. You know, you always want to include the entire bone, but also from a lung imaging standpoint. CT scan will give you more detail, but also involves quite a bit more radiation and cost. CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis can help find primaries in those locations as well um, that plays a role in staging. Bone scans can uh, evaluate the extent of any bony involvement, and biopsy is usually uh, indicated if it already hasn't been done. But additional labs, uh, even MRIs, uh, we had a talk earlier this week that commented on the uh, ability for T1 sequences, for instance, to, with pretty good detail, show you the extent of the bony involvement, but also elaborate on the soft tissue component of any tumor. I think it's important to answer uh, questions for yourself. Uh, like, what is the patient's expected survival? Who else do I need to communicate with to coordinate this patient's care? Oftentimes, you'll get a better idea in talking, if, if the patient has had a diagnosis already, in talking with their hematologist, or, you know, their hemonc or medonc doctor, uh, to get a, a good feel for what their prognosis is. They also will be able to elaborate on any current uh, treatments they're undergoing, the timeline involved, what potential windows might be available to take advantage of from a surgical standpoint. It's also important to know what the patient's expectations and goals are. Uh, I know during my um, experience here at UW, I can think of a handful of patients that I may have overtreated. So just because we can do something doesn't always necessarily mean that we should do something or that it's best for the patient. You also need to answer questions for the patient. <clears throat> Certainly, if it's a, an initial consultation, you'll find that you've probably developed more questions than you have answers. But things that you can address are painting a picture of what the next steps will look like for the patient, and I think that that is helpful. You need to talk about treatment options, both surgical and non-surgical. And importantly, you need to address whether weight bearing needs to be restricted or protected, uh, or immobilization, you know, whether it's warranted. The reason being is uh, whenever, uh, you, if you have a destructive lesion in the bone, the integrity of that bone is compromised. And uh, as a result, we've come up with several criteria with which we can assess the risk. Uh, one of those is Harrington's. Uh, 
And that's uh, specifically for the proximal femur. You'll look at things like a greater than 50% of the diaphyseal cortices being compromised, large lesions, persistent pain after radiotherapy, uh, which suggests that the structural integrity of the bone is compromised. Also, uh, primitive destruction of the subtrochanteric femur region. Probably more uh, familiar or common uh, in our language is Morel's criteria, where a greater uh, than or equal to an eight score warrants prophylactic fixation. You take site, uh, pain, lesion, and size into consideration. We've had studies, however, suggest that uh, there are limitations to these scoring systems. Both do not account for tumor biology, treatment responsiveness, functional status, comorbidity, and longevity of the patient, all of which are very important, and as uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned, many of which are moving targets currently. Uh, this paper by Benka et al. Et al. Uh, demonstrated that Morels had a, a very high negative predictive value, but a low positive predictive value, and as such, uh, a significant amount of overtreatment in those patients. Uh, some efforts have been made to <clears throat> come up with additional uh, modalities to look at this in a more objective uh, manner. Uh, these are two uh, papers that talked about CT-based structural rigidity analysis, and that was shown to have a higher sensitivity and specificity uh, compared to Morel's and led to a change in surgical plan in up to 25% of cases, uh, but it's still not widely used clinically. In my clinical practice, uh, functional pain really is probably the most uh, important single variable that I consider in deciding whether to uh, offer uh, surgery or, not, or recommend surgery or not. And I wanted to go through a couple of clinical scenarios that uh, I um, have dealt with. I had a 59-year-old female who presented to my clinic. Uh, she had fallen and had left elbow pain, and so they got an x-ray and found uh, what looked to be a you know, large lytic lesion in her distal humerus. By the time she made it to my clinic, however, her pain had completely resolved, and my physical exam, I was unable to elicit uh, any pain. So we talked about uh, options, and uh, the patient decided that uh, she ultimately wanted to wait it out and not undergo surgery. We got a biopsy that was consistent with metastatic breast cancer, was, which was a diagnosis she was unaware of. And um, she subsequently started uh, therapy, and we followed her closely with serial uh, x-rays. And you can see nine months later, you have some sclerosis, consolidation of that lesion, and uh, she still is in no pain. An 80-year-old female with multiple myeloma uh, was noted uh, on uh, routine plane films to have uh, lytic lesions in her uh, proximal femur. She was in Alaska and came down. Uh, her doctor up there had placed her on a non-weight-bearing status to protect the bone, uh, and as a result, she got a very large uh, DVT PE and was rushed uh, to a hospital here in Seattle. When I examined her in clinic, uh, I ranged her hip, I ranged her knee, uh, test for rotational, you know, uh, just tried to incite pain. I had her stand, and then I, I had her stand just on that leg, and none of that uh, elicited pain. And so, yeah, again, in discussing uh, surgical options, we decided that uh, we'd get a CT scan to look a little bit closer. You can see the cortex is intact. You see some scalloping there, but uh, the cortex is intact and we have continued to monitor her with uh, serial uh, imaging, and she's doing well. In contrast, uh, this was a 69-year-old female who also has multiple myeloma, and if you can't uh, see anything, you're not alone. It's, it's very subtle, but uh, you know there's some mineralized speculations proximally, maybe a, a, a faint uh, silhouette of something. Her primary doctor had ordered uh, an MRI and it did show a large uh, marrow replacing lesion uh, in her hip. Uh, she had right knee pain and an inability to bear weight. She did have some osteoarthritis. We got x-rays down around the knee, and she had osteoarthritis, but it was certainly out of proportion to, uh, to what she was experiencing symptomatically. Uh, 
And as a result, we again discussed options and uh, she opted for prophylactic fixation. And at her first uh, post-op visit was feeling about 85% better than she had uh, preoperatively. We talked about biopsy and really the take home with biopsy, uh, which is why I bolded and underlined it, is unless a patient has a known primary neoplasm with bone biopsy proven skeletal metast metastasis, the treating surgeon should biopsy the lesion in question. And uh, out of principle, I don't uh, send, I don't send remings uh, to pathology um, because I think if you find out uh, that it's a primary bone tumor, uh, you've already contaminated the rest of the bone. Um, so having frozen uh, section available is important. Uh, obviously, if the patient has widespread disease, um, it would be, you know, again, more likely uh, to be metastatic disease. But in the case, uh, many times, if you do have those resources available, you can fix these patients in a single stage and uh, potentially help quite a bit with their, their function and symptoms. But when in doubt, wait it out. And I know I can speak for both me and my uh, partner, Dr. Thompson, we're always available and willing to answer uh, any questions or concerns you might have regarding these patients. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Folks to continue our conversation. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you for the opportunity to talk. So. Um, as both Dr. Harwood and Dr. Thompson mentioned, um, very important to the evaluation work of a patient with metastatic disease or a lytic bone lesion or a destructive bone lesion is understanding what the actual tumor type is. <clears throat> and I think sometimes we get into the mantra of METS, 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 and every destructive bone lesion is similar, but certainly uh, with the advancements in the medical treatments and even radiation treatment, it's important that we understand the nuances of those. And so I'm gonna go through each one of those and um, really having a resource that you can rely upon is important. And this is an article by Dr. Thompson and some former fellows here uh, published last year in JAOS where they go through each different um, primary tumor type and talk about the relative survival, the potential for fracture healing, what the medical management options are, sensitivity to radiation, even some surgical uh, recommendations. And uh, I'm going to use this as a framework to march through each one of these. And uh, I think that this is also a very valuable resource um, for everybody in this room. So first uh, primary tumor to talk about is metastatic lung cancer. Uh, this continues to remain the leading cause of cancer-related deaths. And you should consider this or think about this if a patient presents with an acral or a cortically based metastasis. This is actually a patient we saw in clinic just last week, and you can see a cortically based um, destructive lesion in his distal fibula there. Overall, these patients have a short expected survival. However, with extended targeted therapy such as PDL1 or EGFTK inhibitors, they can see an improved survival rate. Generally, these are very radiosensitive tumors. Um, and up to 80% of patients will see at least some partial pain relief and up to 50% can have complete relief of their pain. And you should expect that these lesions will not heal and that's important when considering uh, your treatment options. The general treatment approach that we have for these or that when we address metastatic lung cancer is surgical stabilization with radiation therapy. Metastatic renal cancer is also a can be an ac acral metastasis. These are very hypervascular lesions, as we all are aware of, and it's important to know this as you prepare for surgery. Anticipate blood loss and the need for transfusion, and also to evaluate them and have them undergo preoperative embolization. This is a patient we had just last fall presented with a pathologic fracture of his distal femur, and you can see the uh, embolization there demonstrate a very vascular lesion. These patients, if they have a solitary metastasis, have a fairly good survival rate, 50% in five years. Um, if there are multiple or visceral metastasis, that survival drops fairly significantly. And then there is also a propensity for local progression of the metastasis. And this is important as we consider implant survival. So uh, this study uh, by Letzenden et al., they show that there's a, up to a 17% complication rate when you treat patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma with fixation alone, 
and revision of these procedures has an even higher complication rate. And so that coupled with the propensity for local progression and even that solitary metastatic disease with resection can have an improved survival. Oftentimes we will treat these patients with a metastectomy with resection and reconstruction as we did in this patient. Metastatic thyroid cancer has a relatively low incidence of skeletal metastasis. However, when these do occur, they, you can expect that the vast majority of patients will have at least one skeletal related event. And it's not surprising that if they have a skeletal related event that their survival um, would be poorer. This is also a pa patients that you would want to consider preoperative embolization, as you can see uh, was done here. And these have an intermediate radiosensitivity, um, but overall a better survival compared to many of the other carcinomas that we see the metastasized bone. They additionally have an improved recurrence-free survival following wide metastatic, or excuse me, metastectomy of solitary metastasis. And so for these uh, reasons, it is uh, often encouraged to do a resection with reconstruction for this as well. And so, a treatment approach would be metastectomy with reconstruction versus possibly fixation and radiation therapy depending on the location as well as the, uh, the number of metastasis. Metastatic breast cancer is the classic mixed lytic and blastic appearance. Uh, the vast majority of these patients will develop skeletal metastasis up to 70% and their one year survival after orthopedic treatment is in the range of 45 to 60% and it's even worse in patients who have a HER2 new positivity. Bisphosphonates and denosumab are an important uh, adjuvant in treatment for patients with, in order to prevent skeletal related events. And there's been multiple um, reviews that have shown uh, significant pain relief in patients uh, with this adjuvant treatment. These are highly radiosensitive lesions and they can even prolong or prevent the need for surgical intervention. And so our treatment approach to this is fixation and with uh, radiation therapy. Metastatic prostate cancer. This is the most frequently diagnosed cancer in men. Presents with blastic metastasis, as you can see here in this picture. It does have an affinity for the axial skeleton, which is important to remember because it can cause core compression. And up to 85% of patients with prostate disease will experience uh, bony disease, although skeletal related events are uncommon, that's due to the blastic um, nature of the disease. So as you can imagine, based on this picture, if this was all lytic, you would expect that it was had fractured by now. However, due to the um, blastic nature of the disease, the uh, bone has yet to fracture. These are highly radiosensitive, and so sometimes, um, or often, non-surgical management is a viable option for these patients, especially because they have good healing fracture potential. However, once they require orthopedic intervention, their one-year survival is only 30%. And then our general treatment approach is fixation with radiation. Multiple myeloma requires a skeletal survey in order to diagnose because they are, these are classically cold on bone scan due to the osteoclastic activity. They are very sensitive to systemic therapy, and so chemotherapy is the first line treatment. And then if the patient is a candidate for a stem cell transplant, that would be a consideration as well. Non-operative treatment can often uh, be appropriate for them, even without radiation therapy. Additionally, bisphosphonates are, are an, an important adjuvant in order to reduce the skeletal-related events. In a patient who is a candidate for a stem cell transplant, we would often consider um, aggressive treatment of that lesion prior to t transplantation, and that is to avoid a lapse in their treatment um, post-operatively. These are highly radiosensitive and often curable for a solitary plasma cytoma, and then their fracture healing potential is the best of all the tumor types that we've discussed. A general treatment approach would be fixation with possible radiation therapy or even nothing depending on their uh, response to systemic therapy. Lymphoma of bone can be uh, relatively radiographically occult, or it can present as a limit lytic or permeative lesion, as is seen here in the distal femur. However, on MRI, you see a very uh, extensive uh, extracortical extension and marrow replacement. Survival is better in these patients, in the younger patients, patients and those with locally confined disease. 
And the primary treatment for lymphoma of bone is largely systemic with chemotherapy and possibly radiation. And they often see a very dramatic response and resolution of the disease and do not require any sort of fixation. So you can consider delaying their fixation even if a pathologic fracture occurs and if there is limited functional consequence such as in an upper extremity. These, however, are patients that you really want to follow longitudinally and clinically due to the structurally weakening and compromising of the bone from the chemo and radiation therapy. So our general treatment approach, obviously a biopsy for a diagnosis, often protected weight bearing and weight out the systemic therapy um, for resolution of that. The last one we'll talk about is melanoma. This is only, accounts for only 1% of all skin cancers. However, it's the majority of the skin cancer-related deaths. First-line treatment in general is local removal and a lymph node biopsy. And, however, once patients have disseminated melanoma, up to 60% will experience a skeletal-related event. And once that skeletal-related event occurs, their survival can be as short as two months. Um, there have been uh, favorable prognostic variables that have been uh, discovered, and that, which are three. The first is a delay from diagnosis to um, their onset and need for surgery. LDH less than 8.5, hemoglobin greater than 11.5 for peri perioperatively. And then a solitary skeletal metastasis um, has a better prognostic, prognostic as well. These are intermediately radiosensitive and there's uh, increased survival with a complete resection if it's a solitary or oligometastatic disease. Our general treatment approach, which uh, is in this lady that we just did last week, is uh, fixation with radiation therapy versus a metastectomy, if, again, if it's solitary or oligometastatic disease. So I know that was a lot, and um, but uh, I think it's important, again, when treating these uh, different primary tumor types to understand the nuances of them and how it, both the systemic therapy, their response to radiation, and then um, their need for surgical intervention can be different, and that's what Dr. Thompson is going to talk about now. Thanks, John. That was uh, really good. So we've talked about a lot about the different types of cancer and the general approach to workup. We're now going to kind of shift gears and talk about how, how do we approach uh, these patients? What do, we, what do we do now that we've spent uh, our energy understanding them as a person and understanding their disease in the, in the new... Uh, uh, era that includes treatments that may um, portend of survival much better than we would typically expect. So our first step is to reconcile the orthopedic goals with the uh, oncologic goals. And that really comes down to predicting survival. Um, as it happens, we're not good at that. Medical oncologists aren't good at that. Um, and so we have to use the best tools that we, that we have. This is a, a very um, convenient uh, tool that we use frequently in our clinical practice called pathfx.org. This is um, a program that was developed at, um, in Boston, no, I'm sorry, Baltimore, um, and it's now on version 3.0, but what it does is it uses uh, Bayesian modeling uh, to predict survival in, in specific circumstances related to the patient's presentation. And so by going online, uh, accessing the, uh, the login, it's a free, um, it's, a, uh, it's free software, but you, don't, you do need to register with the program. And inputting the patient's uh, characteristics and presentation, you'll be presented with a, a probability of survival at 3, 6, 12, up all the way through 24 months. And so this is an, an example of a 75-year-old patient with uh, small cell lung cancer. His ECOG is two, so not that functional independently. He presents with a pathologic fracture and a hemoglobin of 7.8 and um, a lymphocyte count of 3.2. He has multiple skeletal mets, which is an important um, prognostic factor in most cases, but not as important as the presence of visceral metastasis. And so this patient also had visceral metastasis. And you can see that the survival is not, is not good. And that would, be, that would need to be weighed heavily in, in how we approach that patient from an orthopedic perspective. In contrast, uh, that's a typo, but this would be like a 45-year-old male uh, with thyroid cancer, good performance status, no pathologic fracture, pretty good lab work, and he presents with a solitary metastatic lesion. And you can see the stark contrast uh, in his expected survival at 24 months, which is between around 65%. 
And so though it seems laborious to take a few minutes to get online and log in and input this data, it can make a, a big difference in, in how you approach the patient's care, something I would encourage us all to do. Most importantly, though, I think we want to uh, pick up the phone, interrupt clinic, and call the, and call the medical oncologist. Uh, because what these models won't show us is the patient's receptor status, whether or not there are any um, targetable mutations uh, or agents or trials available to the patient. That could have a dramatic impact on survival. Dr. Vokes just talked a little bit about melanoma of bone, typically uh, associated with a very poor prognosis uh, once, a, once an SRE occurs. But in my practice, I've seen two patients now who went on trial targeted therapies with extended survival. Uh, we treated their fracture non-operatively and they healed. And so these, these models are helpful but not perfect. And so it's the additional perspective you can gain by reaching out to the oncologist as much of an interruption as it can be to our, our daily um, workflow at times is, is probably the most important step that we take in the treatment of, of metastatic cancer. You thought we were going to talk about surgery, but most of what we recommend and do is, is not surgical. So as both Dr. Harwood and Dr. Vokes mentioned, bisphosphonates are an important part of our plan and, should, and something we should be recommending to the uh, medical oncology team. Uh, bisphosphonates have been shown to uh, decrease the incidence of skeletally related events in multiple cancers, as Dr. Vokes mentioned, uh, including uh, potentially life-threatening complications like hypercalcemia or press syndrome, uh, and also have been shown to decrease the incidence of pathologic fracture. Rank ligand inhibitors like denosumab have been shown equivalent, if not more efficacious, in reducing the risk of SREs. I'll say that the risk of complications is also higher when you give these medications in this setting. The dose is, is higher than you would give for somebody for osteoporosis. But I think when you weigh, um, and just for an, an example, recently some uh, data was presented at CTOS. Um, uh, that showed up to a 17% incidence of, uh, of um, avascular necrosis of the jaw when using denosumab at the, at the oncologic dose. And so it's not an insignificant risk, but oftentimes in comparison to the risks of uh, metastatic disease, it, it's very justifiable. Um, as we talked about optimizing the patient's uh, outcome, uh, we want to consider other potential modalities that can be helpful for the treatment of these patients. Radiation, uh, as you've uh, picked up on, uh, is a very important part of treatment. The most important step for the radiation oncologist is to identify uh, any mechanical si or any signs of mechanical weakening of the bone, so that we can make a multidisciplinary decision about the order of treatment, whether we uh, proceed with prophylactic fixation followed by radiation, or if radiation as a monotherapy may be appropriate. Bone pain in the setting of metastatic disease is caused by really two factors. The tumor is present, it's an inflammatory condition, and it, cause amplified, it causes amplified bone turnover. Um, and so that type of pain, that aching pain that the patient can experience even at rest, is often very responsive to palliative radiation in a radiosensitive tumor. And reports would suggest that up to 90% of patients experience at least some pain relief, uh, and uh, half report a period of complete uh, pain relief. We know that single and multiple fractal, uh, fraction regimens are effective. Uh, and equivalent in their effects in this setting. So um, that's important in patients who may have socioeconomic stressors. The radiation oncologist can modify their treatment plan to, be give, to give the dose over a shorter or longer time, depending on the requirements of that specific case. We also know that retreatment is safe and effective. So um, when, con when receiving a consult for a patient with a pending pathologic fracture, um, the, uh, oftentimes there's a, we're told that the patient's already had radiation and it didn't work. And, Oftentimes our recommendation is we, we should try it again because surgery is not justified at this point or the surgery is, uh, is associated with a, an elevated risk and we should try other things. Radiation obviously uh, comes with the risk of uh, complications, but I'll say the doses given in the palliative setting, they're around uh, a third of what we give for patients with sarcoma and these risks are uh, much less prevalent. So the risk of, of fracture due to radiation is 18%. Uh, with a 40 uh, gray dose and around 4% for a 20 uh, gray dose, which is the um, most common um, cumulative dose we provide for uh, palliative uh, treatment. In addition to radiation, there are a lot of other uh, potential therapies. This depends very heavily on your, the setting of your practice, where you're practicing and, and what, what is available. I won't go through this list in great detail, um, but I would just encourage you in your local practice setting to find out what, is, what, what the possibilities are, what ablative therapies might be 
uh, useful for patients who may not be good operative candidates or, or who present with a lesion in a very anatomically difficult location to access, where the morbidity of a surgical intervention would be uh, greater than uh, we'd like. This can include things like radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation. And something that's gotten a lot of recent attention is magnetic uh, resonance guided focused ultrasonography which has been uh, reported to provide similar treatment responses but a faster rate of pain relief when compared to radiation therapy alone. Dr. Vokes mentioned arterial embolization, and that's typically paired with surgery and radiation, but um, uh, there are also instances where one might consider that as a monotherapy. Um, if you do that, though, I would encourage you to, to admit these patients to the hospital for regional pain control uh, because patients can experience a uh, significant uh, pain syndrome or post-embolization syndrome and regional anesthesia is uh, uh, helpful in, in managing that. If you've decided to operate, um, the first thing is uh, tending to perioperative risk. And so we um, first will look at the patient's perioperative medication list. We want to look for things like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, which can have a profound effect on the patient's ability to heal. It also can elevate uh, bleeding risk. And um, has a half-life of about seven days. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors typically are something we can navigate around relatively easily, hold the medicine for seven days, perform our surgery, allow the wound to heal, and resume uh, two to three weeks thereafter. So we can minimize that interruption in systemic therapy, which is the most important factor in their uh, treatment of their systemic disease. But there are also agents that are not as easy to navigate around, like Avastin, which is commonly used in um, urologic gynecology. Um, and, um, excuse me, gynecologic oncology. And uh, it's important to recognize this medicine because this can have a very dramatic detriment on wound healing. It's, an anti it's a monoclonal antibody against VEGF with an extremely long half-life relative to our typical surgical plan. So you want to try to hold this medicine for a month before and a month after surgery. Um, and so you can see where this would require uh, significant coordination with the patient's medical oncologist and also weighing whether or not holding that medicine, if it's having a systemic effect, is really in the best interest of the patient uh, in order to perform a, a palliative surgery. Dr. Vokes mentioned the importance of embolization in specific settings. Typically, renal and thyroid uh, are associated with a very high bleeding risk. Uh, I don't, we don't always embolize uh, these tumors, uh, particularly for performing an extra-articular resection, but anytime we're planning to treat them with an intra-articular uh, margin, then uh, embolization is definitely part of the... Um, and a very important part of the preoperative preparation. I've also found in my practice that hepatocellular carcinoma, which is actually quite rare uh, uh, to present with skeletal met, uh, metastatic disease, is one that I uh, embolize. These are cases, though it's tempting sometimes when they come in through the ED, these are cases you don't want to add on at the end of the day. You want to do these uh, cases uh, first thing in the morning with your ATM anesthesia. You want to consider an arterial line, maybe central venous access if you're expecting a large blood loss and do everything you can to try to uh, optimize their perioperative risk as it relates to anesthesia. This is a patient on the right who presented with metastatic hepatoc hepatocellular carcinoma with a pathologic fracture. The tumor was quite vascular. We performed an embolization and then uh, cementation with fixation of the, uh, of the fracture. As we'll talk about in a minute, we, uh, in the upper extremity, we'll often augment our fixation with uh, cement rather than using intermedullary fixation. Why do we treat fractures before they occur? What's the justification for treating impending fractures? We know uh, that this is more cost effective. It improves function, decreases blood loss, and uh, minimizes operative time. I would say the fifth factor that I always talk about with the patient is sometimes in treating um, the fracture uh, prophylactically, we can simplify the, the, the complexity of their care. After the bone fractures in the setting of metastatic disease where you have poor bone quality and maybe the potential for poor fixation uh, with your implants, uh, uh, an IM nail might be off the table and you might be looking at a much more morbid procedure if the bone does go on to fracture. Our surgical construct in, gen in general should allow immediate stability and unrestricted activity. We don't want to take a patient uh, uh, and do a surgery that's gonna require a prolonged recovery. We wanna augment that construct so that it can withstand range of motion as tolerated and wiping as tolerated, uh, if at all possible. We want that construct to outlive the patient's expected longevity. As I mentioned, that's a hard thing to predict. And so we, you know, we'll typically try to uh, 
uh, uh, choose a very durable construct, especially when treating uh, breast cancer with a targetable mutation or um, uh, other diseases where we expect survival to be good. We want to recognize predisposing risk factors for reoperation. Dr. Vokes touched on this, but one of the common scenarios that we see in our practice are, is metastatic renal cell carcinoma. The reoperation rate uh, when treating a pathologic fracture to renal cell carcinoma is quite high. The healing rate is low. And these tumors, that's due to host, uh, multiple factors, including the fact that these tumors are not responsive in general to systemic uh, or uh, chemotherapies. So this is a, a patient who presented to our clinic about two years ago with a um, uh, non-united pathologic fracture of the proximal femur. He had been treated with an intramedullary nail, followed by an exchange nail, followed by a grafting procedure, and continued to have this large lytic defect in the pertrochanteric femur with ongoing pain with uh, weight-bearing. We revised him to a proximal femur replacement with a total hip. And um, about, it was, a, you know, it's a big surgery to go through, and we counseled him about that at length. But at about six months post-op, he came in and was back to lifting transmissions in his shop and, and uh, climbing in on a boat. He's a boat mechanic. And so we, uh, look at, we recognize that his presentation and his expectations uh, and expected survival is a situation that we thought we could improve and revised that intramedullary fixation to a proximal femur replacement. Dr. Uh, shameless self-citation, but you brought it up, so I'll, I'll continue. The, this paper, this paper, I think, is very helpful. Um, I think the, the my proudest contribution to this paper was were these tables, tables one and two, because what it does is rather than um, I put Einstein's picture in the top left, because Einstein said that things should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, and so minimize things to the salient points. And so I think this table is effective at doing that. Um, uh, from my biased perspective. But what it does is it takes the anatomic area of the lesion and then breaks the clinical context into four different uh, situations. So on the left, we have a situation where there's an impending fracture, but there's limited bony destruction, and we expect that the patient's disease will be responsive to uh, non-surgical modalities like chemotherapy or radiation. So we might be more prone to consider fixation or augmented fixation on the left. But as we start to move to the right, things become more severe from an orthopedic perspective. So the next column over is an impending fracture, um, but you see severe bony destruction. There's a large leg defect. You're worried about the, um, the implant surviving uh, as a load-bearing device. Or the patient's not expected to be responsive to non-surgical modalities, so like the, the patient with metastatic renal uh, cancer with a proximal femur fracture that I presented. Not always, but that may, choose, that may move us uh, further to the right uh, and start to think about segmental resections and reconstructions, um, or arthroplasty rather than fixation. The third scenario is um, an impending pathologic fracture when there's already pre-existing osteoarthritis. We don't want to take the patient to the operating room to try to modify their risk related to or impending pathologic fracture and ignore the fact that they have end-stage osteoarthritis, so we do a surgery and they still have pain. So we want to recognize the situations and treat them appropriately. The other time we might consider an arthroplasty or in situations where the, um, the articulation is at risk if there's any uh, progression of that uh, disease. And then finally, fracture. And I think the important thing that Dr. Vokes mentioned is that a lot of these fractures don't heal. In lung cancer, you can expect about a 0% healing rate. Myeloma is a little bit better, around 50%. And we weigh that very heavily into, into how we decide to treat uh, those situations. Treating a patient with myeloma, for example, um, we might consider doing a simple intramedullary nail as quickly as we can, get them on systemic uh, chemotherapy, because that's going to make the biggest impact on their survival. And we uh, will, um, there will be a good chance that we'll see bony healing in that sharing a relatively stable device will be effective uh, in, in uh, treatment. Surgery. So there are some certain there are some generalities. I don't think we can go through all the anatomic areas and and talk about every every potential circumstance you'll encounter, but we can talk about the generalities that we use to choose a construct for our patients. So when we're treating a patient with diaphyseal uh, disease, we often will use an intramedullary device. These are just, this is just an example of an intramedullary uh, carbon fiber cephalomedullary nail. My, this is a tibia with uh, an acral uh, metastatic lesion due to lung cancer. We added cement, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. 
Whereas when we're treating disease around the metathesis or periarticular disease where the joint is, is preservable, we may switch to a cement augmented uh, uh, locking plate uh, instead to, to address the, the specific biomechanical environment uh, where the lesion is occurring. We want to consider augmenting our construct with cement when we have areas of large bony lysis. And I mentioned the importance of understanding that most of our orthopedic implants are meant as load sharing devices that are, are meant to survive for a period of time while the bone heals. If we nail a large segmental defect and, and fail to augment that with a, a structural um, um, bolus of cement, uh, over time that nail will fatigue because it's cycled every time the patient steps down and is bearing all the load of that limb. And so in situations where we have areas of large bony lysis, we want to consider augmenting it with uh, cement. Again, if we think there's a low uh, anticipated susceptibility to adjuvant therapies, that would be another reason to include cement because we're not expecting any remodeling or healing, so we want to fill up the defect and create a structurally sound construct or in fracture healing is likely. This is just an, uh, an example of a 45-year-old patient who presented to the hospital with severe pain in her uh, left femur. Uh, this is a diaphyseal lesion, so we would typically think about treating this with a nail. She, of course, underwent a complete staging workup and was found to have uh, oligo uh, osseous um, uh, lim primary lymphoma of bone. She uh, fractured between the time of presentation and the time we could get her into the operating room. So we performed a closed reduction uh, uh, and intramedullary uh, nailing of the fracture. As we were taking our final projections, we saw a large bony defect. I wouldn't typically be inclined to cement either a diaphyseal lesion or a lesion due to lymphoma because um, lymphoma typically responds well to systemic therapy and we see a good chance of fracture healing. But in this case, we thought the segmental defect was large enough um, that we did uh, go ahead and supplement that with cement. And at about one year follow-up, she's back to full activities as tolerated without pain. And you can see that her bone did heal and it just sort of healed around that cement bolus. We want to recognize those situations that we may benefit or the patient may benefit from segmental resection and reconstruction uh, as a single definitive treatment. And so again, uh, to reiterate a lot of what Dr. Volk said, um, if there's a chance to affect the patient's survival by treating oligometastatic disease with a metastectomy, we will consider a segmental resection in that case. If we think fracture healing is unlikely, we may uh, revert to a segmental reconstruction that's going to be immediately stable, allow weight bearing, and have a, 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 an acceptable survivorship. Or in a patient who's high fun or I, I'll say in general, in patients who um, are expected to have a high functional demand, we may err on the side of the more definitive reconstruction if they're appropriate candidates. This is a patient who presented with metastatic uh, breast cancer. When we first looked at the x-ray, we thought, well, this might be something we could treat with a locking plate and cement, but we got some cross-sectional imaging because we wanted to know more about the structural integrity of the proximal humerus. You can see that the, there is significant uh, tumor burden uh, in the subchondral uh, bone of the proximal humerus. And so rather, we performed a uh, segmental resection and reversed uh, total shoulder. I'll say that the reverse uh, total shoulder is something that in the oncology realm, is, uh, it uh, offers a lot of potential for palliative intervention. Um, we're able to provide the patient with a stable uh, glenohumeral joint and pretty immediate function uh, that relies on the deltoid. When do we consider arthroplasty? So I mentioned before that if there's destruction uh, or the adjacent articulation is at risk, we want to consider using arthroplasty in order to decrease the chances of reoperation, either for pain or, um, or risk of uh, non-union. In general, we will we'll, we'll choose cemented arthroplasty. Patients who have metastatic cancer are um, receiving systemic chemotherapies that are gonna affect their ability to heal. We're gonna be recommending radiation because we, we don't want their disease to progress and affect the, the structural integrity of our construct. So we typically will cement um, stems when we, when we perform arthroplasty. There's a risk of fracture when using a press fit and, and weakened bone. Um, and we don't expect bony ingrowth or ongrowth with one exception and that is in choosing an acetabular cup, we know that uh, porous tantalum and trabecular metal perform well in patients who've received very high doses of radiation for pelvic malignancies. And so for uh, hip replacement in a patient with metastatic disease, I personally will perform a hybrid procedure using a uh, trabecular metal cup and a cemented stem. Uh, 
and then radiate that lesion uh, afterward. And we know that those cups perform well. When I, was, when I started residency, I learned that when you're treating metastatic disease, you should protect the entire bone and you should use a long cemented stem if you're, using, if you're uh, performing an arthroplasty. Again, I think the intentions are appropriate. You want to prevent the need to reoperate. You want to prevent causing a periprosthetic fracture by uh, putting a short stem in that's potentially going to act as a stress riser and weak bone. But more recent data, uh, based on a series out of Mayo, suggests that selective use of a long stem is, is appropriate. So really only when you're treating somebody with multiple myeloma or renal cell carcinoma, statistically speaking, is it justified to put a long stem in. And the reason I bring that up is that there's a lot of risk with using a long stem. I also uh, graduated residency thinking that bone cement implantation syndrome was something I needed to know about for my board exams, but something I wasn't likely to see in practice. Um, in reality, in an orthopedic oncology practice, you have a very good chance of seeing it. I think I'm looking around the room and, and remembering, remembering a few cases we've seen in the last couple of years. This is a potentially life-threatening condition. We have no way of predicting who's going to um, uh, experience this complication apart from identifying those risk factors that we know are associated with an increased chance of uh, BCIS. Patients who present with pathologic fractures, metastatic disease, when a long stem prosthesis is used, and if we use pressurization. And I'll also say patients with pre-morbid or pre-existing um, right heart failure are also at an elevated risk. And so we need to recognize those scenarios, be judicious, and avoid using a long stem if it's not indicated. And um, um, Talk to anesthesia, let them know when you're getting ready to manipulate the canal, make sure the patient's hydrated before you cement the canal, make sure they're not 100% O2, and uh, again, perform this surgery at the right time of day. One special circumstance I thought was worth mentioning is periacetabular disease. As we know, these surgeries to treat a, a lesion near the, near the acetabulum can be very morbid. Um, and so we don't wanna operate at the drop of a hat. We wanna try to choose, obviously, what's best for our patient. We know that in multiple myeloma, periacetabular lesions treated with effective systemic therapy, maybe with radiation, only if it doesn't delay initiation of systemic therapy, because that's the most important factor, may take a lesion even as aggressive appearing as this one on the left and avoid an, avoid an operation altogether. So are there any alter, alternate non-operative modalities that we should try? Can we protect this patient's weight bearing for, for six weeks to three months while they get systemic therapy, monitor them very closely, uh, potentially try to avoid an, an operation? I would say in general, we try to perform minimally invasive procedures when possible. So uh, percutaneous column screws and cementation of a defect that doesn't affect the articulation is something that uh, may be effective at preventing fracture and preventing a bigger problem. And recently, there's been an increasing interest in balloon arthroplasty after radiofrequency ablation. Um, I've done uh, one of these with a, a kyphoplasty device. It uh, works you know, very well and is a much less morbid operation when it's appropriate for the patient. This was that patient's presentation x-ray. I think this was a transfer from, our, or, uh, from Harborview. Patient before uh, undergoing treatment went on to develop protrusio on the left and a, and a comminuted proximal femoral fracture. This was refract, relapsed refractory myeloma. Um, and, but the medical oncologist felt the patient's survival was good and they recommended aggressive surgical management to restore her function. So I'll say when you decide to perform arthroplasty, go big and leave nothing to question. She ultimately went on to undergo proximal femoral replacement and a very significantly augmented uh, total hip replacement using a cup cage construct and an anterior column pin. She's now walking four months uh, post-op and was just conditioned this week for a uh, stem cell transplant. After you've operated, don't forget the rest of the, the, rest of the recipe. You wanna always recommend post-operative radiation therapy and follow up with your patients to make sure they've received that because our construct depends on that. If, our, if the disease progresses, we may have a compromised construct. We need to recognize that uh, VTE is common in patients with metastatic carcinoma, with a rate of DVT at least of 7% and P of 4%. And importantly, be kind to the soft tissues for the same reasons we don't expect an uh, ingrowth stem to be effective in this setting. We need to protect the soft tissues. They're not gonna heal as well as, as, well as your healthy uh, patient undergoing arthroplasty for arthritis. So make, make an appropriate incision. Don't try to perform uh, minimally invasive procedures and use good soft tissue technique. Maybe just a keystone case to finish. 
This is a 52-year-old patient who presented to my clinic with a diagnosis of avascular necrosis of the right hip. She had a remote history of breast cancer 10 years prior and no disease, no known disease since that time. She came to our clinic expecting a hip replacement. We obviously looked at the x-ray and identified this permeative process with a subcapital femoral head fracture. Um, it didn't look like AVN to us. She also complained of back pain, so we got an x-ray while she was in clinic and she had compression fractures in both her thoracic and, and lumbar spine. So we ordered an MRI. We saw this and this. We admitted her to the hospital, recognizing this as possibly late recurrence of, uh, or a late distant recurrence of breast cancer. Performed a biopsy and confirmed that. This is her chest x-ray prior to that preoperative uh, workup for a biopsy. And this is her, ch her staging chest CT. She has complete um, filling of her right uh, lung field with tumor burden, and there's direct invasion of the tumor into the IVC. I'm thinking, if I'm in your shoes, palliative medicine consult, optimized pain relief. Uh, but this patient came in with her teenage kids. I think one was just getting ready to go to college. She went from living a healthy life to all of a sudden being presented with a very terminal diagnosis. We put the energy in to do the IHC and, and found out she had good, she had targetable mutations. So her, her prognosis actually wasn't quite as poor as this picture may paint. Um, we worked together as a team. We talked to medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pulmonologists, and um, treated her with a short course of radiation preoperatively to uh, decrease her perioperative morbidity. Um, anesthesia felt she might be a good candidate for a supine, a short supine procedure. So we performed a DA uh, hemiarthroplasty in the supine position under spinal um, in about uh, 30 minutes. And um, she walked out of the hospital, went home, and I, in chart searching her last night, she's now about 20 months out from this operation and receiving a, a targeted therapy. Uh, and so I think this case really illustrates the importance of taking a holistic look at the patient, talking to the other providers involved, understanding the patient's goals, understanding where they're at in life, and seeing how you can exert a positive impact. Sometimes that's not operating, but in her case, I think this was the right move. questions. Um, so my question is, the, the most important decision that, that most everybody in the room will have to make is when they should uh, refer a patient that comes into them with a probable skeletal med versus when they should decide to take that on themselves. And so we've all seen, um, I, I think our residents should be capable of treating most of these, but we have all seen, you know, the occasional uh, disaster come in when a, a primary, you know, tumor was treated as a metastasis. So, what are your general um, guidelines? And and thank you. Um, that that was fantastic. I think our general approach is we 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 try to be available. And if you have questions, reach out. If you if you ever have a question, it's important to involve somebody who can who can help. If if the patient has confirmed metastatic skeletal disease, as Dr. Harwood presented. I think it's okay to treat that patient yourself. Obviously, if, it's a, if, it's a, if the treatment's gonna require a surgery you're not facile with, then I would refer. But if it's a, if it's a nail and the patient has confirmed metastatic disease, I think that's okay. I think the one situation where we think it'd be helpful to call us is if it's an undiagnosed situation. You have a, something that could be a primary bone tumor, you wanna make sure that biopsy is performed according to our oncologic principles and we avoid complicating uh, their outcome. What about a common scenario where there's a known primary um, adenocarcinoma in somebody without a history of metastasis who's presenting to us with skeletal pain and a, and a lesion? I, I think, yeah, I think still you want to perform a biopsy as if it were a primary tumor because if it, were, if it could be a sarcoma. Patients who undergo chemotherapy are at risk for secondary malignancies, and so I'd approach that in the, in the same way. One of the things we didn't, I don't know that we touched on, and weigh in, guys, if you, um, treating, the, uh, treating the patient with an intraoperative frozen section is something we have, a, we have the ability to do at our institution, but when we talk to folks in the community, that's not something they're, they're really comfortable with, because their oncologists or their pathologists have a hard time 
saying definitively that they're looking at an adenocarcinoma, not a sarcoma, without more advanced studies. So, but in a center like ours, we can identify those situations and decrease the time to treatment, uh, decrease the number of times the patient has to undergo anesthesia, and simplify their care by doing an intraoperative frozen section and, and, and fixation. Yeah, I think I may not have made that as clear. I, I, I like how you're dichotomizing it. You know, if, if, they have, if they have diagnosed metastatic disease, you know, in the bone, then I think it's, it, it's fair game, and it's a surgery you're comfortable with. Otherwise, probably best to either discuss with us or send to us. And um, anybody else have a question? Going back to your patient. Here, use, use the mic. Your, uh, uh, going back to your patient that had the, the right proximal femur fracture and the contralateral left acetabular fracture with Petruzio, what was your timing of the surgery, and how did you go about tackling it? With, uh, I should say, like, what was your game plan yeah. in the steps? Well, when we looked at the x-ray, we weren't sure, right? So, <laughs> so we, we knew something had to be done. But if that patient had metastatic lung cancer, we might have taken a different route. We talked to the oncologist. As I recall, it was re relapsed refractory myeloma. But they were confident they had a good treatment option. And so in that case, they prioritized surgery. They said, take care of the fractures as quickly as you can. Make her ambulatory so that we can, so that we can do our thing. So it was a you know 24 hours of conversation with the involved providers, and then we went in initially on the we did the proximal femur first. That's a, the simpler of those two interventions, and if we could give her one good leg to walk on, that would be better than what she had. So we we prioritized the segmental proximal femur replacement. She did really well with that physiologically. She was looking good. Then we went back into the more complex hip, uh, reconstruction. I've had a similar case go exactly the opposite direction where a lady uh, avulsed both of her tibial tubercles due to myeloma and was, uh, you know, going south faster than they felt comfortable uh, having a, a treatment window. And so we prioritized non-operative treatment and, and getting that systemic therapy for her. One, one more question. So, uh, again, people in the audience uh, may on occasion use uh, long stems, um, and, I, and I agree with you. Sort of the reflexive use of those isn't really a great idea. Um, do you take any measures when you're using those to minimize uh, the likelihood of uh, bone, bone cement um, implantation syndrome or embolization? Yeah, I can. I, mean, I actually had a case this year we reviewed at M and M where the gentleman he had a proximal uh, femur lytic bone lesion. I did a cemented total hip, a little bit um, like a 170 stem, so not full, and uh, he coded on the table. And uh, so that's been a learning process for me. A couple of things we do, Dr. Thompson already mentioned, which is are they well hydrated? Are they well oxygenated? Paying attention to their cardio cardiopulmonary status. And then if you're really concerned, you can uh, distally, you can drill like a relief um, uh, hole in the stem to allow the pressure, pressure, pressurization, excuse me, to escape. I don't know if you would add anything. I would say that. I was going to say, too, I, I always try to remind myself to talk to the anesthesiologist as well intraoperatively. I know they really appreciate that. You know, giving them a two or three minute heads up so that okay. they can prepare. Yeah. Uh, two thoughts. I, I would say as a matter of routine, if I'm using a long stem, we should vent the canal. We don't pressurize. We we accept a glued-in stem um, uh, or or a Welch C uh, mantle. Um, of the cases I've seen that we suspected BCIS, there is a there is a tell. There's a warning sign. When we were reaming the canal, there's a small deox a small desaturation, mm -hmm. small cardiopulmonary changes that clued us in. Um, and so, communication with the anesthesiologist, I think, is most important in taking those preventive measures like venting the canal mm -hmm. and uh, not pushing it on the stem size or, or pressurization of the cement. There's no evidence but the, uh, that it's effective, but the other thing I do is I specify um, low viscosity cement. So you really don't generate um, as much back pressure when you're putting your stem in. Anybody else? OK. Um, um, thank you. All right. well, it looked like a lot of work went into that. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you.